fast and break things. Anybody here knows which company has this as their motto? Tesla? No. <laughs> oh, sorry, sorry, not Tesla. Um, SpaceX. No, that, that would be a bad... Uh... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Nobody? Uh, 37 signals? No. Uh, Facebook. Uh, yeah, that's the official motto of Facebook. And um, yeah, when you think about it, Facebook is one of the few companies that could have uh, had adopted this motto because, for example, it would be a terrible motto for a moving company, <laughs> right? And um, but these days, yeah, even Facebook, they're moving away from that that mantra, that philosophy, and they're trying to do things, you know, with all the scrutiny they're under, they're trying to do things in a more uh, sensible and careful manner. But today, I, I want to go back in time a little bit and see why they adopted this philosophy in the first place. And I think it goes back to a divide between two ways of doing things, two approaches to software development. Uh, what I would call the hacker way and the engineer way. So, um, by hacker, I don't really mean you know the type of people who hack into the FBI uh, and so on, but just the idea of building something quickly, uh, getting things done, and kind of having a, this like DIY approach. So uh, that means being focused on the short term and uh, on the result. Uh, a hacker is usually going to be kind of a generalist because they, they need to pick up different things to, to get the job done. And uh, the consequence, the, the downside of this approach is you might run into scaling issues, right? So once the project gets more complex, uh, maybe the funda foundation isn't super solid, and that's when you run into trouble. And then on the other side of things, you have the engineers. So engineers are very good at long-term thinking, focus on getting the process right, so following the best practices, doing things by the book. They specialize in you know, back-end, front-end, DevOps. But the downside is uh, engineers often fall prey to premature optimization, right? When you spend so much time uh, agonizing over picking the right database that you never actually get the project off the ground. And I'm sure we know people like that. Now, I'm not trying to say like one is good, the other is bad. And of course, I'm talking about really broad generalizations here. Um, but I do think it can be a useful way of framing things, just uh, as a thought experiment. And in fact, it can also apply to technologies, right? So things like jQuery, WordPress are all about getting the job done quickly, um, customizing things, injecting a little bit of code here and there. And then you have more like formal typed uh, libraries and technologies like TypeScript, Redux, GraphQL, which are more about consistency making your code more robust and predictable, and so on. And my, my theory when it comes to, well, JavaScript is that it started off in the hacker column, but uh, over the past couple of years, it's been moving to the engineered side of things. It's been uh, growing up, uh, becoming more complex, more specialized. And I think that's why we have this idea of JavaScript fatigue. So this is a post that came out uh, about three years ago, talking about how learning JavaScript was too complex, too many libraries, things changed too fast. And, you know, I think things got better over time, but still kind of the same situation. In fact, this is why I started this project called uh, The State of JavaScript. It's an annual survey of the JavaScript landscape. Some of you might have seen it before or even uh, participated in. And uh, having this view, this overview of trends was already very helpful. But uh, the fact remains, when you look at what it takes to build uh, an app, it's still pretty hard, right? First of all, well, you have to manage two totally different environments, server and client. And then uh, you have all these little bricks that you need to fill in. That's not even all of them, but just a, a sample. So, uh, well, let's look at this. So, for example, on the client, you have to worry about loading your data from the server. 
uh, which includes also things like maybe caching that data when you access it again, um, keeping it up to date, uh, batching the requests, and uh, there's great libraries for that, such as uh, Apollo, if you're using GraphQL. And then you have to worry about state management, right, in, once the data is uh, available locally. So you could use Redux for that. You've got bundling, uh, Webpack, uh, the view layer, CSS. You'll probably use some kind of UI library. And that's just on the client, right? On the server, you need a, a way to store your data, an API layer. Uh, worry about routing. So routing could go either in you know server or client, but let's say we're using Next.js for this uh, hypothetical scenario. And Next.js has its own routing thing on the server. Um, moving on, you need some kind of authentication uh, layer for user accounts, so Passport is a pretty good one. Server-side rendering, uh, and then deployment, um, of course. So all of these are you know, already a lot of work. Um, there's a lot of things and they don't really have that much overlap, right? If you're learning Apollo one day and then Webpack the next, there's not much in common, pretty different concerns. The thing is though, this is like half the battle because then you have to worry about how you're gonna connect all these bricks together. Uh, so if you have your Apollo data and you wanna transmit it to your React components, that's already a whole thing you need to learn. And a couple years ago, it used to be with uh, this thing called higher order components. Then it changed and you were supposed to use render props and now you have hooks. So every couple years, uh, the patterns change. You need to learn a new API, a new way of thinking. And that's like only one little connection. Another example on the server, if you have uh, your SQL data and you wanna transmit it to your GraphQL API, where, where there's like entire companies built around solving that little connection. There's like Hasura, Prisma, uh, PostgreSQL, all focused on just that little thing. So uh, yeah, on one hand, well, all these blocks, all these bricks are super powerful and super flexible, and they really let us do amazing things that weren't possible before. But on the other hand, uh, I kind of wonder if we're uh, in this situation, right? Where we are so used to the complexity that we don't really question it anymore. And uh, we don't really dare dream of something better. Now, uh, this something better, the way I like to think about it is uh, Rails for JavaScript. And what I mean by that is not Rails as in a MVC server-side framework because Node has a couple of those. But the idea uh, of a platform that's like, uh, that helps you be productive and has very strong conventions and is really um, made from the ground up to, to work seamlessly and help you move fast. And uh, I'm not the only one thinking about this issue, you know. Uh, here's, for example, Nick Schrock, the, one of the creators of GraphQL, saying that the biggest gap in the ecosystem is a Rails for GraphQL system. So, um, yeah, that's what I wanna talk about today. Basically this uh, quest for <laughs> the holy Rails of JavaScript. <laughs> so, a little bit about me first. I live in uh, Kyoto, Japan. And uh, when I moved to Kyoto a couple years ago, well, I decided to take a break from what I was doing and kind of start fresh. So I wanted to start new projects, learn new technologies. And one of the things I learned was this fr framework called Meteor.js. Uh, and I really liked Meteor. In fact, I liked it so much that I ended up writing a book about it called Discover Meteor. And what I really appreciated about Meteor is this idea of having only one language, JavaScript, but also only one code base. So because Meteor was full stack, uh, you could easily share code for components, models, uh, share uh, APIs, or just helpers. And I found this to be a really elegant way of dealing with that complexity of managing both environments, right? Trying to 
think of them as as close together as possible. So uh, another thing that was really cool is Meteor just out of the box already uh, filled in a lot of these little uh, boxes, uh, and that was in two thousand twelve when it first launched. So even back then, Meteor was really uh, forward thinking and. To this day, there's not that many other solutions that can uh, do as much as Meteor. So, you know, it had its own uh, system for uh, publishing and subscribing to data. It had a thing called MiniMongo, which was kind of an emulation of the Mongo APIs in the browser. Um, it has its, its own uh, view layer called Blaze before React, Vue, and so on. You might be wondering, well, if Meteor is so cool, why aren't we all using it today? Well, uh, a lot of things happened. One of them is that the, the company behind Meteor, called uh, MDG, uh, is also the same company that made Apollo, uh, the, uh, a suite of tools for uh, managing GraphQL APIs. And what I found interesting is that if you go back to that uh, idea of hackers versus engineers, well, Meteor is really on the hacker's side, right? It's like a, a broad, generalist technology that's focused on letting you move fast. Uh, Apollo, on the other hand, is very specialized on you know, one part of the stack. Uh, it's for the you know, enterprise market. Um, that's how they monetize it, at least. And um, because they had these two different focus, it was hard for them to, to be, you know, as focused on Meteor, I guess, as on Apollo, and in fact, they recently sold off Meteor to another company. So, well, we'll see what happens with that. But because Meteor didn't, I guess, quite fulfill its potential, uh, I actually decided to throw my own hat into the ring and create my own framework called Vulkan.js. So I, I've been trying to become that uh, mythical Rails for JavaScript. And um, I actually use Vulkan Jazz uh, as part of my day job. So I work for a company called uh, Zen's Home, which is basically an Airbnb for the Japanese market. And they were uh, kind enough or, or crazy enough to let me use Vulkan to build their product. And it actually turned out pretty well because uh, this site, this app is kind of kind of large, you know, you can think of it as Airbnb, uh, but it's not that complex. So there's lots of very common uh, components like forms, uh, lists of data, and that's exactly the kind of thing that Vulkan is good at, right? I really wanted to make a framework that's uh, focused on the 80% the most common needs when building web apps. So, well, what's inside Vulkan? So the first thing you should know is it's actually uh, still built on top of Meteor or around it in a way, but uh, we've replaced some of that, those bricks to be a bit more uh, mainstream. So for example, instead of Meteor's own data system, we use Apollo uh, because Vulkan is architectured around GraphQL. We do still use the Meteor bundler. Uh, we have React for the view layer. Uh, Vulkan has its own set of components, which I will talk about later. And then on the server, it's a mix of uh, Meteor stuff and uh, the GraphQL stack. So one com uh, concept that is very important in Vulkan is the idea of uh, models. So just like in Rails and uh, MVC frameworks, the model is super important. And we use those models to generate uh, the GraphQL API, and also uh, because we have that knowledge of how that API is generated, we can also create a whole set of tools and helpers around it. So we can handle has one, has many relations, we can handle forms, and even complex components like uh, data tables. And this, by the way, is also the, the basic concept that Facebook uses for their uh, GraphQL API. They have this uh, PHP model that then generates the GraphQL code. So to understand uh, why you would like, uh, you would want to do it this way, 
let's just take a look at a simple uh, CRUD GraphQL API, right? Create, read, update, delete. So even if you don't know GraphQL, uh, hopefully this will still make sense. So in GraphQL, you have types. So here's a type for the movie model. Let's say we're building a, a list of movies. Um, then you need to be able to do something with those types, for example, uh, query them to get either a, a single movie back or a list of movies. And each of those queries takes an input and returns an output. And each of those need their own types. We also want uh, mutations, ways to you know, modify our data. So create movie, update movie, delete movie. And each of those, as you can see, also have their own arguments with their own types. So that's a lot of types, right? Uh, for a simple CRUD API, uh, you need to define all of these. And then if you want to do things like filtering, pagination, sorting, and so on, that's more uh, API that you need to define, more types, and so on. And then once you have your types, you actually need to tell your server what to do with them, right? How to handle these queries and mutations. So you need to, to write these functions that take in the arguments, query the database, return the data, and doing all that while also validating the data, uh, making security checks, and so on. And well, in Vulkan, we automate all of that. We take your uh, model in JavaScript and we generate all the things I just mentioned, the types, queries, mutations, resolvers. So, well, first of all, it saves you a ton of time because it's all uh, this code you don't need to write yourself. Also, uh, it's really good to, because it lets you keep everything in sync because otherwise, once you modify your uh, model on the left, you also need to go in your GraphQL code and modify it by hand uh, that schemas can get out of sync, it can be very messy. So that's one advantage, and because we have this control over the API layer, we can do cool things, like for example, uh, help you with forms. So who here uh, likes to code forms in web apps? Okay, not many people, right? Because, well, forms are complex. If you think about the, the stages of uh, just editing a document, first you need to load that document because you want to know what you're editing. You need to generate the form and actually you know, generate the components for the checkboxes, uh, text fields, and so on. You need to handle the form state. So if you're using React, you, know, you need to have that local state that keeps all the values up to date. And then finally, you need to submit your document back to the server. And in Vulkan, well, we already have all the bricks to do that for you. So we have the single document query to load that data. Uh, we have the model that tells us exactly what fields are uh, required in the form. Uh, Vulkan offers you a pre-made form component that can handle all that state. And finally, once we're ready, we just submit the document back to our update mutation. And so the result is this is how you write a Vulkan form. Uh, that's all you need. You just tell Vulkan the collection, in other words, the model, and uh, the ID of the document you need to edit, and all the rest gets generated for you. So here's an example. Uh, as you can see, you can generate pretty complex forms with you know, field groups, different types of inputs, custom inputs for uh, image upload, and so on. And we can apply the same kind of basic concepts to other components like data tables. So we can uh, generate the table for you, uh, automatically generate filters based on the type of each column, uh, sorting options. And because Vulkan knows so much about the API, we can generate the right front end that matches that the syntax expected by the API, basically. So if that sounds uh, intriguing, there's a tutorial you can do. Uh, and the tutorial is itself a Vulkan app. So it's pretty cool because as you go through the steps, uh, you modify the tutorial itself. And every time you modify it, it unlocks the next step as you build this uh, little movie app on the right. 
So to go back to uh, this idea of hackers versus engineers, uh, Vulcan is not the only you know player in that that space trying to unify both sides and simplify JavaScript development. Right? There's Next.js, there's uh, Gatsby, there's Meteor itself. Uh, so you know I'm not sure which one will triumph, or maybe it will be a mix, or maybe something new that we haven't seen yet, but. I definitely think there's a demand for uh, something that bridges that gap and makes us uh, into hack engineers. Okay, yeah, th that name kind of sucks, <laughs> but uh, hopefully by then we'll have something hack better. Hmm? Hackernees. Oh, hackernees. Hackernees. Yeah, just to, uh, drop the okay, hackernees. Hackernees. Okay. Hackernees. Hackernees. Okay. Hackernees. Sounds like a pirate. <laughs> Discipline private. Yeah. So in conclusion, well, my wish for the future is that 10 years from now, when people ask uh, what uh, Ruby on Rails was, they'll say, oh, Rails, well, it was a little bit like Vulcan.js, but for Ruby. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Any questions? Well, um, well, first, I mean, it's, uh, it's impressive and uh, ambitious, so, <laughs> I mean, yeah. Uh, just um, because you, you, you integrate so many bricks, as you call them, into a single, you know, one framework with pretty large scope, um, which, of course, has lots of benefits, how much would you say that involves sacrificing flexibility. Like for example, you have this module, this brick, and you just find out that the default doesn't quite fit your problem domain. How, how easy or hard is it to sort of like sort parts out? And how flexible can you <coughs> still be, even if you have this full stack framework? Yeah, that's definitely the downside of this monolithic approach, like you lose a bit of flexibility. So, I mean, I, I wouldn't say right now where it's not 100% where we want it to be, but ideally I think there is a way to do it where you still, you rely on a lot of standards first. So you use like, if you use React, in theory, you can take your React components and move them to a different backend and things should still work. Um, if you use GraphQL, you should be able to just take your front end and, and connect to different GraphQL API and things should still work. Uh, so we're really trying to do things in a way where it is like, you know, all generated in one block, but at the same time done so in a way where it kind of makes sense even if you want to later move away. Like, for example, the APIs that get generated, um, they went, we went through several iteration of just changing the syntax to match what other companies in that space do uh, to be the mo more even though there's not really a standard for GraphQL APIs, but we're trying to really do something that makes sense. And hopefully one day, you know, you'll be able to, if you, if you want to just switch out Vulkan for something else on the back end, but just keep your front end uh, if you keep the same uh, API syntax. So I think it's a hard problem, but I do think there's a way to do it where at least the downside is mitigated, let's say. And Comparing, comparing this to Meteor, where Meteor, at least the, the classic version, that was like really one brick with its own package system, its own uh, data uh, like uh, layer system, its own view layer, that was like really impossible to switch anything out. Vulkan is a lot more, a lot better in that respect, I think. Silly follow-up question. Am I doing this uh, WebSocket uh, thing? I made a WebSocket server. For example, if you would like to use WebSocket for uh, communication between front end and back end. Is that something you can easily implement with Falcon JS? Um, you could, but well, then I mean, easily is a bit unfair yeah. question, maybe. But I mean, I mean, it wouldn't uh, be harder than any other app, like if you're building it from scratch anyway. No, but if you if you have front end and back end separate, then you sort of you know what's in between <laughs> is, is usually. Left for you to yeah. sort of bandage yourself. But well, I mean, you can always add stuff, but it's more about 
well, if you're not you doing things the Vulcan way, you kind of mm -hmm. you still need Vulcan, and because you still need to carry the weight of all the stuff you're not using in a way. So, I don't know. You kind of have to decide on a case by case basis. Yeah. But I do think the framework really shines when you do use the GraphQL layer, the forms, the data tables, and all the pre-made components. I'll definitely investigate. Uh, oh, sounds interesting. Uh, by the way, if you have not questions but like criticisms uh, about my delivery or the slides or anything, let me know because I want to improve. Uh, yeah. Um, you mentioned a complexity at the beginning of your talk about uh, you know the how each framework links to each other, you know, such as like GraphQL and React, for example. Um, how does Vulkan just change these kind of aspects? Because you still rely on the same frameworks in the end, so if they start changing their own APIs, you still have to relearn the kind of thing as well. Yeah, so I'll repeat the question for the, yeah. the recording. So, how does Vulkan JS deal with uh, the complexity? Because when the APIs change, um, you still need to, uh, to worry about that. Well, Vulkan can act kind of as a buffer in a way between the, the changing APIs and, and the developer. Like, for example, when we migrated from React Router 3 to 4, which is a, a really big change, uh, we were able to keep the, the way you declare routes in Vulkan the same. So that for the end user, it wasn't as big a change. Of course, if the Vulkan API changes, then you, okay, you need to worry about that. So it kind of moved the problem in a different spot. <coughs> but still, I, I do think that we can uh, ease things um, a lot. Uh, we migrated from Apollo 1 to 2, uh, which is also uh, a big change, and we were also able to do it in a pretty seamless way. Um, I mean, it can't be much worse than just doing it yourself when you're using like the regular libraries, because uh, it's quite painful sometimes. So you may want to mention that in the presentation, because there was yeah. one of your pain points you mentioned in the beginning. And yeah, that's a yeah, good point, yeah. You may want to mention it in passing at least. Yeah. One thing I I don't have much hands-on experience using Rails, so maybe for people who don't really know that much about Rails, you might want to sort of add a bit more ex explanation why being Rails for JavaScript is something you um, want to have as a goal. Uh, what what what's the, um, the attractive aspect of Rails that you want to emulate? I'm taking notes, I'm not texting. No, no, that's that's cool. that's a good point. Um I didn't start development I had to start development right when Node took <coughs> off, right? So I didn't have I didn't touch Ruby at all. So um you'd hear people talk about it. Yeah. Like, oh yeah, you know, yeah. like you could do this in Rails. And you're like, Yeah and you don't know what's going on, but um and then you just all I heard was the complaints after they used Rails right. later on. Yeah. So like uh, for a lot of companies where like they're like yeah we made those decisions but we were in a hurry and now we're kind of paying for them and so that's what I heard a lot from there so I kind of see where your point is coming from like you need to get something done and then set up but at the same time be able to transition to something bigger when you start scaling and yeah. so I, I I see where you're coming from but for some people who don't have the background in Rails at all they wouldn't see what is it the novelty of it is any of us a, c a current or previous Rails developer. Uh, what would you like best about Wales? What was sort of the main? Everything works out of the box. You don't have to do any plumbing. Uh -huh. You just hug the app and we're building things. Right. Right. It just works. Right? And that's the aspect you were referring yeah, to. Exactly, yeah, exactly. Uh, the other aspect, it's easy to get a mental model of how things work. Mm -hmm. Because there's not so many moving pieces. Uh, we're asking for JavaScript pieces, but what? Uh, uh, Sasha was mentioning there's so many different moving parts that are always evolving separately because they're driven by separate teams. Uh, it's it's much more difficult to follow, you know, what's being done in every part. Uh, while uh, Rails or Django is something kind of that basically it's a fixed uh, application that is very well defined, standardized, <coughs> and then um, once you get through it, you can learn it pretty fast. Okay. Fair yeah. one, one thing that I really like about Rails in general is 
the team that is building the app is trying to make it easy for developers to work on it and like hide away a lot, a lot of complexity that you can have with frameworks. So I don't know how Vulkan uh, works around this, but I, from what you, s you s show us, like for forms, all this kind of stuff, seems like it. Mm. But that's one of the good points of it. Uh, and usually it works. I mean, like hiding complexity is quite a good thing in many cases, but sometimes, like, you know, it has to actually work because if it doesn't work and you have all this complexity hidden, yep. what do you do? So, yeah. one of the things the Rust teams do is you can always, like, exit from the framework. So, even for the SQR model, you can say, oh, okay, stop, I don't want to use Active Record, mm -hmm. I want to use raw SQR at that time. That would just work. So that's one of the things they are building on. Uh, if you're interested, there is a good talk uh, in 2018 by the main, the main contributor of Reddit, mm -hmm. uh, DHH, uh, about how we build abstraction of those things. Mm -hmm. We take the SQL play <coughs> as a yeah. maker. Yeah, I think, well, Vulcan has the same idea where you can always do things your own way. I think the main difference is when you talk about client-side uh, apps, if there's things you're not using, it still adds to the bundle and um, you're still kind of paying the cost and performance for the parts of the app you're not using. Whereas in Rails, if you don't use Active Record, it doesn't make any difference for the, the user. So yeah, it's a bit different on that level. Um, it's more, for example, for the, for the, for the API, um, that's what that's that was my question. How do you say, hey, I, I want extra fields to be in the model, showing to the to the front end because they are built from all the fields of the models, uh, of the fields of the mm. models built up together or something else? Can you do that? Can you yeah. define how it's like uh, end up generating the the API or are you? Well, must you stick to the, to the end query? You see what I mean? Um, no, yeah, you can. Uh, you, you have a lot of control, actually. Uh, so... <coughs> because sometimes I want my API to look totally different from the model. So... <coughs> Uh, you can do control and plus. Yeah. Okay, so basically you would do this using uh, this property, resolve as. Um, so if you have a user ID field in your database, you can tell it to resolve as a different field in your API. Okay. And you can give it any name, uh, any type, and then just tell it how to get the related data. So here it's kind of just querying the data to get the user in your database. So this is basically the, the has one relation, but it could be literally any code there. So you could return uh, you know, a string, you could return a static value, you could query another API, um, you can do anything you want. And that's really what's really cool about GraphQL because when you query your API, there isn't really any difference between the user ID field that's actually stored in the, the database and uh, GraphQL only uh, user field or anything else. Okay. So basically you have your schema that generates the API, but they're not a one-to-one -one match. You have control okay. uh, over, over that. And of course you can also just write your GraphQL schema by hand. You can add little bits uh, if you really need something custom. So have a lot of uh, flexibility. Yeah, maybe you should, in your presentation, maybe you should mention mm -hmm. that this is not fixed. Everything is not fixed. Yeah. You, you can customize how things are generated because to, to me, I was thinking, okay, is the API really looks like the model? It must look like the model because like, most of the time you don't want to. <coughs> there is like yeah, that's a good point. Even field. Oh. Uh, just one question. 
So uh, you said there's like limits to it, right? What 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 limits would you say they are? Like where what would you not recommend using it for? You know that sort of thing. Like you've said the advantages, but what which projects would you not use it for? Like if you could give any examples of that, would be really. I don't know if you have any, but if sure. You know. um, anything that requires a super customized UI or has a really different way of working. Let's say you were building Google Maps. For example, there's no forms, there's no day lists of data. It's just one big map. So I wouldn't recommend using Vulkan um, or what else. I don't know, a game or something. If, if you're not going to use the forms, the data tables, the lists, the data lo loading stuff, um, you can still use it just for your back end and then plug in a custom front end. But yeah, definitely. It's, it's a bit like WordPress, you know, like mm -hmm. WordPress. Um, it's a blog, but people customized it into, you know, real estate sites, uh, e-commerce sites. Yeah, the blue is yeah. massive. Yeah, um, but they're not do doing like games with WordPress. Yeah, or, yeah. there's no WordPress Google Maps. Is yeah, it? yeah. <laughs> so it's a bit like that. A anything where you can take those primitives of lists, forms, and so on, uh, it's a good fit. And if not, you can just build it yourself. I guess. Yeah. Okay, well, thanks. Uh, Any explanation for the logo? I guess it's bricks. Uh, oh, uh, the logo, or where's the logo? The Vulcan logo. Yeah, it's a V. Well, okay. It yeah, I don't know. the V, but <laughs> <laughs> You guys can help me uh, choose. Because I, 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 I want to change the logo, so. This is the, logo. Logo. Ah, okay. well, this is the current logo. And any Star Trek fans here? Because yeah. in, in Star Trek they have this sign, right? Yeah. Uh -huh. So the V was based on that. Yeah. And yeah, the logo of you looks a little bit like it. Yeah, it's exactly. Yeah. So for that reason I wanted to change it, because the logo of you is ah, right. <laughs> pretty similar. Well, not too similar. Not too similar, but maybe too much so. It's, it's a V, so uh, Yeah, these are the two logos I had in mind. Um, but probably we're going to pick this one. That's all I want. Yeah, this one. Yeah, it looks better on the dark. Yeah. Yeah, with this background. And, um, it's yeah. It's a Star so Trek color, don't they? Like all the, the Star Trek the panels, the interfaces, with the red and the yellow lines. And oh, really? Right? Yeah, yeah, I think it's pretty much those colors. Okay, I'll, I'll take that out. Especially uh, <laughs> the next generation, I think. It's all like. Uh, yeah, I've never watched Star Trek, but. <laughs> <laughs> you never watched it? Yeah. It's also a volcano if you flip it, so that's the other <laughs> meaning, I guess. I, I, I have an extra question. Uh, so I worked on Meteor uh, also, and uh, with Meteor, <coughs> not on. Um, the one thing that I really like about Meteor is that it keeps data in the front end on sync with the backend. Does Vulkan also do that? Like the real time right. um, so of Meteor, which is like the key of feature for me. So there's like two different aspects of real time in Meteor. Um, yeah. There's the what I would call the real time and then the reactivity. So Vulkan has reactivity but not real time. So basically, okay, you have to think about real time like is it a um, real-time based on actions from yourself or other users? So like if you click something and it updates instantly, that's like reactivity. If somebody else uh, clicks something and then it updates for you, that's real-time. That's, I was talking about yeah. real-time. And the second one is very uh, resource intensive on the server. Unless you use web servers. But yeah, using web sockets. <coughs> and that was kind of the main selling point of me here, like you said. Yeah. Um, but I, I've always been, been a bit skeptical of that because I think not every app needs it. And most, I think most apps don't need it. And I've seen that it le leads to really uh, big server uh, performance issues uh, because you need to maintain that open connection all the time. Mm -hmm. And I think now with global warming, I mean, it <laughs> might, I don't know, I, I really think it's actually a serious concern, right? Like if, if we build apps in a way that's like 
completely performance like insensitive in a way. Um, it might not be sustainable, and it costs a lot in server costs. So, okay, but we might okay. So you might add a block in Vulkan at yeah. one point. Yeah, yeah. yeah. How to do that? Easy because there is yeah. some usage for that. Yeah. No, I, I, real time I, thing. Yeah, I was more thinking about the way Meteor because Meteor, Meteor everything was real time, and you didn't have a choice. Like even if if your thing only changed once every ten minutes it was going to keep a real time connection open. So we don't, we did not do that, but uh, we might in the future add like GraphQL subscriptions, mm. something like that, okay. uh, when you actually need it. Yeah. Okay. Um, on the other hand, yeah, the, the last part of my answer is, the other thing that Meteor did that was really cool is the, the reactivity in the sense that you update something and it changes automatically. Yeah, it's changed from it. Yeah. And at the same time, yeah. send the request in the backend. If yeah. it's refused, it roll back the UI. Yeah. That would, that's, that's one of the. So we are trying to emulate that with GraphQL and Apollo because Apollo doesn't do it. Yeah, do it does it like halfway, but not completely. So we are trying to do it fully, uh, but with Apollo and GraphQL. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. We <coughs> shared was that a was it, was it a stone or was that a. Mm -hmm. oh, oh yeah, yeah. yeah. Does it have like front end stuff too? No, oh, I guess not. Mm, that would be I cool. Just to have so. like this <laughs> similar comparisons for uh, <coughs> front end <coughs> technologies and, and then full stack like. Uh, you can build it. Mm. <laughs> there is a what's it called? The to do list website. Yeah. Where you have to do list. And <laughs> wow. <laughs> that would too long. That would be terrible to do. <laughs> to do MVC, yeah, I think that's it. So this side, they have examples and well, if you want to use Backbone, for example, um, which is uh, super trendy these days. <laughs> it was in, in its time. <laughs> if you're a hipster developer, you want to use like vintage <laughs> frameworks. Well, <laughs> 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 I mean, yeah. most of these <laughs> You, the real frameworks are like React, Angular, Ember, Vue. Mm -hmm. Ember? Maybe? Ember's kind of... Yeah, I, 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 yeah I said, didn't I say Ember? So yeah. maybe that four fr frameworks. Mm -hmm. And to that list, you could add Svelte, which is uh, yeah. doing pretty well these days. Mm -hmm. But there's, there are, there's not that many frameworks. I don't think the, the problem is... For a while, I think people thought the problem was there's too many alternative for each role. But I think the problem is there's too many roles. So there's too many things to know. There's too many bricks. Okay. Even if there's only one webpack, one React, one this, one that, uh, it's still too much to learn. Yeah. And what kills everyone is the plumbing. Yeah, the plumbing, <laughs> yeah. Cool. Well, I'm running out of battery, so uh, <laughs> I'll unplug. So yeah, thanks. Oh, another. No, uh, there was a fly. Oh, there was a fly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I just wanted to say thanks for uh, your feedback, and that will definitely help me uh, with my talk next week. Cool. Where, where is your talk? Yeah. In Prague, mm -hmm. at the Reactive Conf, cool. which is a pretty big event, I think. And I'll be speaking with people much more qualified than me, <laughs> who are also trying to solve the, these same issues. So. <laughs> and your talk was um, like looked really well put together. Like, yeah, there was a couple of suggestions in that, but I mean, that was if I went to a conference and I saw that talk, I'd be like, that's great. Cool. Yeah, it's done, done really well. Well, you got it for almost free today. Yeah. So. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't have to spend the yeah. how much money on the trip. Ah, I don't know. Yeah. And then but you don't get to see the creator of well, whatever I don't know, Closure Script or something. <laughs> I imagine everyone there, all the attendees, like I'm the creator of this, like, mm. you know, how many hundreds of frameworks yeah. are there? Yeah. Um. All right, thank you, Sasha. Thank you.